I guess we're live. And um, so welcome everyone. I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and very happy to be here today with Anthony Sanchez. I haven't seen him in many years. And uh, so uh, I've known you a long, long time ago. And um, I read your book back in the day, UFO Highway. And I see you've got a few more and you sent me some in the mail. So that's going to be fun to catch up. Uh, and I know you have a new website you were just talking about when we started, so uh, you can tell us about that. I will, I'm going to look at your bio. Your bio is very long here, and I'm going to share, I'll share the screen so people can actually see what we're looking at here, because uh, it's, <laughs> I like a short paragraph, but this is, this will do. Uh, so here we go. Anthony Sanchez is a devoted researcher delving into hidden realms and mysteries of UFO alien phenomena. Since 1989, when Area 51 first permeated public consciousness, Anthony has been enthralled by UFOs. His pursuit of knowledge has taken him to renowned locales across the United States with particular interest in Area 51 and Dulce, New Mexico. He has traversed numerous alleged UFO site crash sites, engaging in interviews, conducting scientific exploration, and most recently his travels brought him to Yosemite, California, where he contributed to the Travel Channel's Mystery of the Outdoors series. And he's got a bachelor in science degree in computer information systems from Western Governors University, Salt Lake City, Utah. And he's he's actually um, got a fascinating background. I'm going to let people read the rest and show them the books here. These are your books and you've got some rave reviews. It looks like UFO mm -hmm. Highway was the first one. And uh, back in the day, we did talk and interview you on that book and so on and then ufo nexus and then ufo highway 2.0 that's going to be fun so very oh, exciting you. yeah that's so really so very more. very happy to see that and uh what do we have here um oh you've got another one the modern oh. ufo slash uap researchers handbook mm -hmm. all right and uh and all the different places you've speak, spoken at. I mean, you've really been on the scene a lot oh, back in yeah. the day. Uh, you did sort of take a hiatus, and I want to talk to you about what all happened during that time. Right. So, uh, so welcome to the show, Anthony. Thank and you, why Ron. don't you augment the bio I just gave you, um, and and you know, kind of talk about a little bit about what you've been doing, where you've been. And maybe you've been on the scene more than I know, because maybe we just haven't been in touch. So maybe we want to talk about that a little. I actually wrote a fifth book called The Crossing. Oh. And um, it's about near-death experiences. Cool. And what I saw back in 2019. So <clears throat> we're talking about a hiatus. The fact that I'm even here speaking with you today is nothing short of a miracle. In August of 2019, I got something called Guillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. I had a sinus infection, and um, instead of the, the immune system attacking the infection, it attacked my nervous system, and it's destroyed my nervous system, my vagus nerve. So within 48 hours, I could no longer breathe, so I have a scar right here in my throat. See that? Yeah. I had that in I had a tube in my throat for six months. Oh my God. I was I was in the ICU for 90 days. And um this is August of 2019. Give me a second. I want to apologize to the audience. I think there's a reason why I have a little bit of difficulty in speaking. It's because of the Guillain Barre syndrome had a permanent effect on the nerves in my throat, but, well, not permanent. I should be able to speak normally within a couple of, within a, within a year or so. Okay. But, but the point is, the point is, is that um, I couldn't move. 
for two years, I was totally paralyzed. I couldn't even lift my head off of the pillow. Um, I had people attending to me. I'm a human. I had to go to the restroom. Uh, I had to be cared for like a baby for two years. I couldn't speak. God. I was mute for two years. And I got to tell you something, Carrie. When you begin to experience full paralysis, by the way, the only thing I could move in my body were my eyes to blink. I could blink and I could look like a normal person. But I couldn't close my mouth. My mouth, I look like a corpse, like a zombie. Mm. I don't even like looking back at the photos from that period. <laughs> and uh, because it it was a dead version of me. And the reality is, is I died three times. And um, within those first uh, 90 days. Wow. And they brought me back. And I saw stuff. I crossed into another realm that I call the vortex. I literally saw, and this is all going to make sense. This is all going to make sense. I saw angelic beings. I saw non-human entities that were essentially grays. I saw demonic entities. And I existed inside of a realm that was not on this plane of existence. And I was able to traverse back and forth. And it was such a surreal experience. It's funny how today we have a Joe, um, uh, we have uh, various individuals, I don't want to put their names out because I want to get in trouble. But we have individuals from uh, reputable organizations like Move On, um, uh, famous authors, who are essentially telling us that these creatures that we are perceiving as aliens are in fact demonic entities. So, okay. Lou Elizondo from ATIP. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Most people probably are. Yes. So Lou Elizondo was actually hit up by the Department of Defense, high ups. And they told him, stop looking into the UFO subject matter, period. And he was like, what? He's like, I'm in. I'm the head of ATIP. I've been mandated to look into this, and you're telling me to stop? And the reason why they told him to stop was because they said, we already know what they are. And if the general public found out what we know, it'll be utter mayhem, chaos around the globe every major religious institution would flip. It would be madness. They claim that these are demonic entities in human terms. Us normal average monkey brain humans, we, we see them as demons because we know them through the religious text. Some people uh, who've done various studies into the archons from the Nag Hammadi Codices, these are the, Gnostic, the Gnostics, like Jay Widener, you and I did an interview with Jay Widener years ago. Jay's brilliant. Some people refer to them as the, the demiurge, which is the evil aspect of the Gnostic religion, or some people presume that they are the archons feeding off of our souls, feeding off of our energy. Well, <clears throat> Joe Jordan of Mufon, I'm just going to say because I'm actually a member of Mufon, Joe Jordan of MUFON, he used to be the state section director of Florida, and then he transitioned to, I believe, South Korea. Anyhow, he has a whole litany of experiences with individuals who claim to have been abducted by aliens, and uh, they claim that by invoking the name of Jesus, they were able to force these aliens to cease their abductions and to leave them alone. Again, another religious aspect. Am I a religious person? Well, no. I was born, baptized a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. But um, <clears throat> my mom removed us from Catholicism when I was over 12. 
we went into uh, evangelical Christianity. And then I had just a lot of bad experiences with it. And by the time I was 14, 15, I had become very focused on science. And um, I kind of lost an interest in, in religious religiosity, religions in general. But if you go to my website, ufocurrents.com, I just did a three-part series on the UFO faith in England and how religions, UAPs, UFOs, aliens, demonic entities, what is the intersection between all of them? Well, that's what I wrote about. Okay. I talk about Lou Elizondo and Joe, uh, uh, Joe Jordan of MUFON in the first article. And then in part two, I really wanted to focus on um, Jacques Vallée. I wanted to focus on Jacques Vallée because uh, I believe Jacques Vallée perceives these as non-corporeal entities that are operating within our consciousness. And to some extent, I believe that he taps into the writings of a, fa a famous author from long ago named John Kill, John A. Kill, who spoke to us about the ultra-terrestrials. These are entities that exist within the outside of the visible light spectrum, the, 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 the visible range that humans are able to perceive. Um, outside of that, there are entities that live all around us. They operate all around us. And uh, so if you look into the ultra-terrestrials and these entities of a conscious nature that Jacques Vallée, Dr. Jacques Vallée talks about, that opens up a whole new aspect to the UFO faith in England. That's part two. And in part three, what I do is um, provide a cross-correlation or a comparison of parts one and parts two. Are we talking about crypto-terrestrials? Mac Tonys was an author from uh, a while back. He passed away at a very young age, but he wrote a book on the crypto-terrestrials, which are essentially entities, in my opinion, that could have existed here on Earth alongside humans and possibly prior to humans, uh, highly intelligent species who today are living in subterranean uh, worlds, deep beneath us, potentially beneath Mount Shasta, beneath, beneath Antarctica. Um, creatures that at some point saw that humans had a numerical superiority and then decided enough of this, these monkey-brained sapien creatures are dangerous. They're killing each other. They are obtaining exponential leaps in intelligence, which is doing what? Which is allowing them to create nuclear capabilities, which is very dangerous to the entire planet. So let's say that Mac Tony's crypto terrestrials do in fact live here possess technology that is far beyond anything we understand. Could it be that they are the ones in the UAPs, the Tic Tac UFOs, the 1964 egg-shaped UFO that's not that, that, that different from the 2004 Tic Tac UFO that Lonnie Zamora saw in New Mexico? I don't know. Or the sport model that Bob Lazar saw at S4 in Area 51. Well, you so, do... You do uh... You do acknowledge that we have a secret space program that they have reverse engineered. And I have been told that the Tic Tacs are ours, by the way, by a, a very deep source um, who's in a position to know. But, you know, people can have different points of view. Yes. And um, I think it's interesting that David Grush last year in front of uh, in front of Congress alluded to the fact that our military, our government, and the military-industrial complex is in fact in possession 
of over 33 downed crafts that are not of human origin. These are technologies that are of non-human entities, non-human intelligences. And the perception is, is that Lieutenant Bill Corso back in 1947 potentially acquired the craft in Roswell. Well, years prior to that in 1933 in Magenta, Northern Italy, Mussolini came into possession of a downed UFO that had crashed there. And I write all about that in UFO Nexus. Okay. That particular crash preceded the Roswell crash by what, 14 years? And after World War II, at the at the end of World War II, the US had proclaimed victory and you know began to wipe out the the um the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese. Uh, the German, or excuse me, the Italians decided to begin working with the West, the U.S. and the U.K. and France. And they gave that ship, that craft, to the U.S. So, was it a saucer-shaped craft like uh, the sport model at Area Fifty One, or was it a Tic Tac UFO? Was it an egg-shaped craft? Um, I don't know. But perhaps the technology from that 1933 craft, coupled with the technology from the 1947 crash in Roswell, not to mention Aztec, New Mexico, where there was another crash, these are the technologies that could have allowed the United States to leapfrog ahead of everybody else with our stealth technology. Phil Schneider, who was at the Dulce facility, and who was ultimately killed after he went into the uh, lecture circuit in the 1990s, the mid-1990s, paying the ultimate price, what he was doing was showing geological samples that were artificially synthesized by gray aliens that were then given to the United States uh, military and the uh, military-industrial complex aerospace companies who were essentially utilizing these artificially synthesized geological samples to create our stealth technology uh, from the paints to the, the actual plating. Uh, it's quite interesting. All that technology just came out of nowhere. Think about this, Carrie. 100 years ago, we barely saw the inception of radio technology. The vast majority of the planet was still on the... Uh, on the uh, horse, they were still on horses and horse buggies, you know, wagon wagons. Trains were barely becoming a part of the vast populace worldwide. Right, so, but you have to acknowledge that uh, first of all, yeah. the Nazis brought over a lot of the technology, and they yeah. had contact with the beings from Aldebaran. And uh, you also have to talk about Atlantis and the fact that all of this technology is also on the walls of the, you know, I, I lead tours in Egypt and the technology is clearly demonstrated over there. So, uh, you know, I have opinions on Egypt. There is a lot of <clears throat> uh, evidence. In fact, even religious paintings back in the day, I'm sure you know the mm -hmm. stories oh, yeah. uh, showing UFOs in the backgrounds and such. So, yeah, there and there's a huge gamut of, of contact experiences right. and even cultures having contact way before the United States maybe even was created, you know. Yeah, I, so, I think Egypt, I think Egypt um, presents us with such a such a vast array of facts and evidences uh, that paint a picture that essentially tells us these massive structures, the, the pyramids of Giza, were not built during the time period that mainstream Egyptology tells us. Sure. The Sphinx alone could be anywhere between 12,000 to 25,000 years old. Mm -hmm. That predates the Younger Dryas incident of 12,500 years ago. Or actually, I think it was 11,600 years ago. I have to look that up. But the Younger Dryas incident essentially put humanity back into the Stone Age. 
Why is it that the that Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, which was not supposed to exist, because according to mainstream archaeology, humanity didn't start its begin its first uh, semblances of civilization until uh, the Sumerians and the Akkadians and the Fertile Crescent of the uh, of Iraq between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, and that was what eight thousand years. BC. So that kind of throws a wrench into mainstream archaeology when we find something like Gobekli Tepe, which is over 12,500 years old. Was that buried intentionally to conceal whatever the messages are on the obelisk of Gobekli Tepe? I don't know, but it's possible. Sure. Well, there is a lot of evidence to that effect, you know, I, um, I've i done a documentary on Gobekli Tepe. I, I went there in person and mm -hmm. it is a fascinating place, uh, but it's a lot more, um, it has a, a diabolical uh, sort of overlay that's not so pleasant as mm -hmm. you might hope. Um, so, so there's issues with that. Um, I'm actually looking while we're talking here, I have, uh, someone sent me a really fascinating exhibit sort of thing of Egypt and mm -hmm. um, all the technology that's evident on the, on the various, you know, carved into the walls and so on and so forth. Right, so right. it's, it's, you know, helicopters and, and other craft, and they even have a car at one point. I mean, it all depends how you look at it. There's also evidence, I think, of programming uh, in Egypt that some of the stuff is, has been redrawn, re, you know, engineered uh, for the consumption of the public, not necessarily how it actually w was over the ages. So there's there's a lot of uh, controversy, let's say, but right. uh, fair enough. You know, I appreciate. So where are you going with this? Because we, you know, you're talking to an audience that's very well versed in, in most of this stuff, right? Right. So, well, I just wanted to show you that in my book, I talk literally about symbolic depictions throughout ancient artwork, ancient sites. And um, I really go in depth into what it was that has been discovered. For for instance, uh, in South America, a lot of the uh, a lot of the megalithic structures that we find in South America, they, too, are twelve thousand five hundred years old to sixteen thousand years old. Exceed far exceeding the accepted time frame by mainstream archaeology. Who were these people? If you look at the uh, if you look at the stonework in Egypt, if you look at the stonework in Peru, you find nodules. You find rocks that seem to have been melted and shaped into form identically. So it, it just makes us wonder. Was there a human society worldwide that was capable of creating technologies that are in that are completely different from anything we have today, and they were just wiped out during the, the disaster of the Younger Dryas uh, event? Possible. Right now, what I'm curious about, though, is actually your experience. So, because um, <laughs> we could talk history, you know, all night and all day, but uh, you know, and Project Camelot has made, as you may know, um, yeah. hundreds, literally thousands, at this point, of interviews oh, yeah. and videos covering all of that, and we have all those whistleblowers over the days and years and going back, you know, all the crash retrievals. I mean, in a sense, Grush coming forward, I don't know who gave him the audacity to say that this is the first time this stuff is being released, but that, of course, was a, an outright lie um, because we've been covering this stuff. Uh, people like you and I are uh, going back well, in my case, it's 19 years now. I've been doing Camelot for 19 years. Uh, even before us, there was, you know, a, a, you know, William Cooper and right. all, all kinds of people that were, as you say, Phil Schneider, disclosing, you know, the information and um, Clifford Stone, uh, crash retrievals, et cetera, et cetera. So this 
is not a new subject. It's not a no, new not at all. Not at all. Story. Yeah. Right. And, so uh, I'm just I showing, can, I don't know, can people see this? I hope that people see this. I can see it. I'm showing, you, this is, uh, in case you want to go to it, it's on my Telegram, but someone put together a really nice a compendium of uh, all the different things that can be seen in, in Egypt and has been found around that, that have been depicted on various, uh, you know, walls of the temples and, and so on, and also Iraq and Iran, uh, but they didn't, I don't think they really emphasized what's in. You know, I, I, have, a, I have a question for you, Carrie. Okay. What do you think is compelling all these billionaires, in particular the Silicon Valley tech billionaires, to construct these massive underground living facilities like Mark Zuckerberg? Why? He's not the yep. only one. Over the past decade, we've seen hundreds of millionaires buying up uh, retired bunkers, silos from the government That's in the true. Midwest and converted them into state-of-the-art living facilities. What do they know that the general public doesn't know? Exactly. It seems like we're potentially on the verge of World War III. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I know, that, I, I would say um, that, you know, that we are, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know who Richard Allen Miller is, but he's a physicist. I've interviewed him dozens of times. I know him quite well. About a year ago, he came out and said that actually in March, end of March, early April this year, and now he's changed his mind. He says it's not going to be this year. It's going to be next year. But nonetheless, he said there was going to be a Carrington-like event that was non, um, not extinction level and that it was going to involve uh, – land masses and so on and so forth. And there is reason to believe, even if you kind of follow the the work of let Dutch sense, you know, you're tracking all the earthquakes, you're tracking the mm -hmm. volcanoes, you're tracking, you know, things that are going on on our planet, that there may be something in the wind when we don't know, and they're not going to warn us. That seems clear, right? Right. So a, that I would channel. say contributes to people like Zuckerberg building something. Right. And I, I pay particular interest to one of the YouTube channels called Suspicious Observers for the guy yes, literally on a very good. basis. Very good. Tells us about these um you know uh these massive solar events that could potential could uh, uh, essentially wipe out the planet, all the electronics on the planet, all of our satellites. It's funny how the Russians just released at least our government is telling us that they have discovered that the Russians have constructed a satellite that could potentially destroy all of our satellites. And by doing so, they would essentially disable our entire military, making it incapable for ships across the oceans, whatever, to, to communicate, let alone get back to uh, land-based uh, communication communication systems so well i don't want to go there because you and i had a problem with the uh, the deep state over interviews we did in the past regarding project leonid but you are uh right. totally familiar with how satellites i mean even elon musk his his network of satellites echoes oh, to some degree uh project leonid but maybe not as sophisticated. Um, so it's not question, you know, I mean, there's no question about it that that we've got stuff out there that we don't know about or we don't know the details about, right? Right, absolutely. And um, I think that, you know, it's so funny that you bring that up because one of the things that I focused on when talking about artificial intelligence, right? The, the reality that we live in now. Carrie, it's an alien reality. Humans are essentially doing what? They are, through technology, facilitating the creation of a non-human entity mm -hmm. with an intelligence that is not only exponentially sharper and more capable than our own, but by factors of hundreds 
we're creating entities that are going to outthink us, outperform us, and essentially control us. I wrote a chapter in my book, chapter 13, called Artificial Intelligence an alien reality <laughs> and in that and in that i talk about a dystopian world that can result one year after the technologies okay you and i used to talk about skynet remember we used to talk oh, about yeah. skynet oh yeah i still Here's talk about reality. it I tell people in my book, be very worried for the components necessary to spawn and unleash a rogue AI entity analogous to Sentinel Construct 1, SC1, that's what I call it, in the little short story that I wrote, are able to exist, and it's already at our fingertips. And this is a truly significant concern. Why? Because consider this. The Department of Defense's Narwhal supercomputer the expansive Starlink constellation, the lethal MQ-9 Reaper drones, the innovative Boeing X-37, the formidable General Atomics MQ-20 Avenger, the pervasive Internet of Things, and unmanned aerial vehicles, the eyes in the sky. These components are now at our disposal, and they essentially serve as a schematic to bring to life an entity akin to the nefarious AI from our short story, like those seen in The Terminator, yet ensconced within the bleak dystopian future depicted in The Matrix. However, <clears throat> unlike in the narrative of The Matrix, where humanity is shackled within a simulated facade, this narrative shines a light on the grim potential of our existing technology catapulting us into a parallel dystopian reality. It's here. It's already happening. The technologies yeah. for Skynet exist. And I know that within the military industrial complex, within the military itself, there are groups that are already operating to unleash that technology against other countries, obviously, but it could backfire and hurt all of us. We have to pay very close attention to the technologies that are emerging, especially artificial intelligence. Well, um, I don't know. You probably <laughs> haven't been following my work, but I did release an article just a couple of days ago that has to do with a compilation of information. Because I don't know. Are you familiar with Dick Algeyer, the remote viewer? No. He's very famous. And the future oh, forecasting, I'm, I'm, they're called the future forecasting group. Well, they're a group of top remote viewers who have gotten together and, and made their own sort of channel. And uh, you can join it, you know, for a monthly okay. fee. And I did, actually, because I have a special interest in this. And uh, I'm one of their viewers... I'm only interested in joining Project Camelot. Sorry? I'm only interested in joining Project Camelot. <laughs> Thank you. Well, okay. But... What I want to say here is that they they have a remote viewer who mm -hmm. is looking at, you know, Beetlejuice. I don't know how you really say it, but Beetlejuice is how mm -hmm. I know to say it, right? Right, yeah. And that Beetlejuice, I don't know if you follow this, but Beetlejuice, we had been notified to keep a heads up and, and to keep our eye out for anything to do with Beetlejuice by our witness called Henry Deacon. And I think you might've met him I, back I in the day, him. Arthur Neumann. Yep. And he came forward under his own name and-, and Terry, there's, actually, there's a video of us, there's a video of us together at- uh, Okay. Wake and Aware. Yeah. So, so, so of course I, I paid attention back in the day when he brought that up. And this is in very early days of Camelot. Mm. And so we're talking arguably around 18 years ago. And uh, so, so I wanted to bring this to your attention because recently, in December 12th of 2023, there was an asteroid that uh, went by Betelgeuse. This is a story. And that it's kind of a red giant star, so to like. Mm -hmm. And that it, it occulted it. It basically created, there was some kind of cloud 
you know, and I'm not a scientist, so, you know, you might not like my description, but I've got links to, to actually the science about I think it. I saw, I think I saw the photo of that. Yeah. And it's fascinating because this happened on December 7th. Well, recently, this is the story. Now, we don't know if it's true or not. We have, there's still investigation has to be done. But Juan O'Savin claims that a thousand people were invited down to Antarctica mm -hmm. to sit around a table. And according to a remote viewer, which could be wrong, you know, we don't know because Juan won't talk about it, but basically sat around telling both the light side and the dark side that the AI connection that had been running our planet, the AI that had been running our planet had been broken, that it was um, stopped. Now, I don't think it was stopped permanently. I think there might be a new rendition of this AI connection, but somehow I think maybe the asteroid that interfered with you know, the path, the direct path between Betelgeuse and our planet in December mm -hmm. might have been responsible for this interference pattern. And um, I'm going to show you just really br briefly a photo. I don't know if you can see that or people can I see can. that. I can. But there is a planet. This is um, <clears throat> they're saying it's it's planning to go supernova sometime in the very near future. In fact, I listened to something, I think it was today, that said it could go any minute, literally. Wow. Um, so there's something going on with that. I'm, you know, this is just a way out there kind of thing, but it seems to have to do with AI and an AI <clears throat> that addressed this meeting in Antarctica talking about the the future and that we have weird people that go down like John Kerry and uh, arguably uh, other people who Obama just went down there, for example, right mm. before elections, there are people, there's a pattern of these people, including Fletcher Pr Prouty, if you know who he is back in the day of the Kennedy, John, John F. Kennedy, uh, his, his administration. So these people go down. We don't know why they go down there, but they go down to Antarctica and one would question whether they're getting marching orders from the Nazi base down there, you know, mm -hmm. New Berlin, uh, New Schwabenland, some, as it's also called, sure. um, or the insectoids that may have a base there because it's always bothered me that Antarctica is called Antarctica, Antarctica yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and various other things. So it just throwing this out uh, because what you brought up. Um, and then do you remember when Buzz Aldrin went down there and then supposedly they say it's fake news, but I think it's real that he came out at a certain point and, and basically said kind of like this Kurtz thing from, you know, heart of darkness or whatever, like the horror, the horror that is something so right. dreadful had he'd seen down there. So, you know, there's a lot of aspects to this story. There is. And I think that uh, I find it very interesting that last year that Obama Barack Obama and Michelle Obama were behind this movie on Netflix called Leave the World Behind, which yes. is about what? Yes. The destruction of the planet, bunkers being built by millionaires, an elite class that wants nothing to do with the rest of us as they depart the world into their bunkers and the rest of us are left to die. Right. To kill one another. The only thing that that movie portrays accurately is that there's a severe tribalism going on right now in our country. The right versus the left. I don't want to get political. Right. Um, I love people. I love humanity. I love the world. My best friend in the world is a far right guy. My other good friend is a far left guy. I love them both equally. I'm a centrist. <laughs> I'm a middle of the road guy, and I'm going to remain that way because somebody needs to be. And Sorry. I can see both sides. I can see both sides. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> was that a psyop? Was that a psychological operation? Yeah. Were they conditioning us for something that's about to come? Leave the world behind? So again, you know, we got to pay close attention to what's being fed to us through the mass media. Netflix is part of the mass media, like it or not, entertainment. 
Absolutely. And uh, do you remember the other movie? Don't look up another a Netflix movie. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't. I don't think I saw that one, but I saw that. You yeah, should leave because the world it portrays again. It's a comedy, but it's also it also has some very poignant aspects to it. The destruction of the planet. I don't want to spoil the movie for anyone, <laughs> but my God, we need to pay close attention to the danger to the dangers that are surrounding us in the great expanse, the cosmos, the universe. Our own solar system is teeming with elements that could end the globe as we know it. And we need to pay close attention because the only ones that are willing to survive it through money are the ones that can afford it, the elites, the 1%. That's not you. That's not me. These are the Bilderbergers. These are the, the Bohemian uh, Grove members. Yes, These except are, that, you yeah. know, I don't know if you heard this a, a while mm. back. This Back in the day, you know, there was, because, you know, after doing this for so long, there was a time when, you know, before 2012, there was all those rumors that everything was going to happen and all kind of craziness. Right. One of the way. things that came out during that time was that the underground bases were not going to survive mm. the the were the were earth changes that would happen mm -hmm. that they would be smashed that those people will be smashed like ants or whatever yeah. i'm just saying i'm just throwing that out because now i know that the technology is far in advance of what oh, yeah. we understand it and maybe those because there are tunnels that have survived all kinds of earth cataclysms all over the they're, world they're, they're still building them i have a picture that i, I know. show you I, these are the chinese armies that are building an underground great wall of steel using a new type of material this right. is footage that was aired on Zhangji satellite television station which appears to show the construction site this is in china right that's underground great it's actually happening and as a matter of fact you know, one of the strangest things that I was dumbfounded over is that I bought my house in 2006, this house that I'm in. Little did I know that 2.5 miles in that direction from my house is a massive underground facility that uh, a couple hundred people lived and operated in for several years. Hmm. It was a Titan I missile complex by Bill Air Force Base. It's in Lincoln. Oh, right. I live here in Lincoln, California. And I was shocked. Yeah. So I wrote all about it. Uh, the abandoned Titan I missile base near Lincoln and formerly uh, in the formerly U.S. defense site, which remains a stark monument to the nuclear arms race of the Cold War era. It's right by my house. So I wrote about it <laughs> in my book. Yeah, and incredible. I, want, I want people to know that I'm writing about everything. Carrie, we need to revisit the fact that I was paralyzed and mute for two years. Right. Thank God that I bought Bitcoin when I did. Because I ended up bl blowing through my savings. Because it couldn't oh. work. I didn't have health insurance. I could not work. Wow. I was self-employed. I bought Bitcoin at the right time. It saved my house. It saved my company. Oh, my wow. eighteen, That's great. my eighteen-year-old son, my eighteen-year-old son, the day before I lost my ability to speak, took copious notes, meticulous notes that I gave him. I gave him my bank account login. I gave him the the PayPal login. Everything, all my business operations, how he needed to run my software company while I was in the hospital. I thought I was going to be there for a month. Oh, I ended, up, I ended up staying for six months, and then it was two years of paralysis and the inability to speak. So then, in um, at the end of 2021, when it all started to come back, my ability to move, speak, I started to work again. But something happened during those two years. My mind was racing. Mm. Everything that I ever studied, everything that I ever encountered, People, events, experiences, histories, education, it all permeated through every crevice of my brain and allowed me to explore. And hmm. I became this prolific writer. Every single article at UFO Currents 
was written by one person, me. Okay. I hadn't written a book since 2010. But since recovering from paralysis, I've written UFO Nexus. I've written UFO Highway 2.0. This is 430 pages of controversial <laughs> information. Oh. You're in it. Bill Ryan's <laughs> in it. This is not, this is not your typical UFO researcher's handbook. Mm. I'm not that kind of a guy. In my book, you're going to find about find out about the secret space program. Good. In my book, you're also going to find out about something that no other book, I believe, UFO researchers can book, has ever talked about. And I think you're going to take a keen interest in this. In this book, Carrie, about to blow you away. I wrote about the RH negative enigma. Okay. You're familiar with that, right? Well, yes. So this is the investigation into the origins and attributes of a unique blood type, type O negative, RH negative, with a specific emphasis on its potential link to extraterrestrial origin, which represents a significant aspect in unraveling the enigma behind the heightened prevalence of UFO encounters, visitations, abductions, and, in certain instances, implantations among individuals with RH negative blood. So I, in this book, reflect on an exchange back in August 25th and 26th of 2014 between me and Linda Mulhau, which was conducted as part of her preparations for her 2014 appearance on Coast to Coast, a segment that was titled ET Warfare. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff you're going to find in my book. Yes, you're going to find all the histories and everything. Um, I even have a section in here, which I think you're going to find interesting. It's called uh, Profiles. Uh, notable individuals in, uh, in this uh, ufological field, right? And one of the names that is in this book is Perry Lynn Cassidy. <laughs> <laughs> Founder of Project Camelot and Project Camelot TV Network LLC, Cassidy is known for shadow operations, the Mars Project on True TV. Mm -hmm. A skilled broadcaster and filmmaker, she co-founded Project Camelot in April of 2006, focusing on global interviews, whistleblower testimonies, and investigations to conspiracies, secret space programs, and extraterrestrial phenomena. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's nice. I'll listen to the book. Go run. Everybody's in this book. I, you know, we're going to find individuals that other UFO researchers would never talk about. All right. Well, screw that. Cool. I'm putting the best of the best in this book. Right. There's a lot of information. Oh, by the way, these books yeah. are in full color. Every image is in full Excellent. bright color. All yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I just got them in the mail, so um, I didn't yeah. even have time to open them up, uh, but I will. And uh, I'll have fun doing that because I really enjoyed your uh, first book, UFO Highway. Uh, right. So have you had any more um, sources, contacts, you know, that that contacted you yes. during this time or did you disappear so much that um i had people that contacted me with information prior to me just prior to me getting sick mm. and then all of that work ceased as i became paralyzed two years of paralysis right and even in the th even in the third year of recovery i could still barely move barely talk and uh i blasted through my savings so all my bitcoin's gone but it's okay. It saved everything. And I was able to make that money back, you know, by working. When I started working again in 2022. Oh, right. And I've been working for a software company, running my publishing company, doing my own software consulting. So, yeah. Since then, have individuals contacted me? Yes. I've had individuals since the, uh, especially since uh, 2023, with David Grush, 
Mm -hmm. Ryan Graves, David Fravor, and even Kevin Day, all these individuals that came forth, they have unleashed a litany of individuals who now want to speak. By the way, my site, UFO Currents, today finally surpassed 1,000 people who have sent me their email. It's only been up for two and a half months. Oh, great. 1,000 people have sent me their email to be on the newsletter. They right. like what I'm writing, the articles. There's a website called Threads. I literally had 20 something people for like a month and a half. But once I released the UFO Faith of Enigma series, as of today, I have over a thousand followers on Threads. And that's brand new little, I don't know much about Threads. I guess it was supposed to be like Twitter or something, but it, oh, it's- Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know that one. But. I still have over 18,600 emails of all the people who have ever <laughs> bought my books. Yes. So I will send them out newsletters and too. But, it's, cool. but the fact that UFO Currents is growing so quickly, it's a testament to the fact that people are hungry for the information. They want to know what this UAP topic is all about. Why is the government for the first time in 50 years interested in holding hearings? So you have to go all the way back to 1968, 1969, the, to the last time the government was interested. As a matter of fact, in UFO Nexus, I have a whole chapter devoted to asking, uh, answering the questions of why we're revisiting. And it's called uh, UFO Oversight Revisited a Half Century Landmark. I literally wrote an entire chapter just on that, telling people, hey, you have individuals like David Grush, perhaps he, some people say he's autistic, or on the, I don't know. Um, and afflicted by certain psychological predispositions that will allow them to speak up, not care about the consequences, and just get the information out because of concerns that they are holding. If that is the case, thank God. Thank God for that. Because now everybody's paying attention. And we need to know the truth. We need to carry it. When I was in 1975, when I was five, I saw a massive cube over my house. Oh, great. Yeah. We had we had an eclipse that evening. It was a massive cube the following evening is when I saw it. Uh-huh. I two years later, I saw two gray aliens with a relative of mine. I spoke about this at the Waking Work. I saw two gray aliens outside the window and like in the wee hours of the morning. And then in 1981, coming back from uh, South San Francisco with my dad and my uncle and my younger brother at Moffitt Field, I saw a massive UFO. We all saw a massive UFO. People were taking photographs from other vehicles. Vehicles came to a stop on the freeway. Yeah, I remember that because, you know, I was born in Moffitt Field. Right. I remember we were talking about that. Nobody, nobody sent those photos to the San Jose Mercury News, the Chronicle, none of the newspapers talked about what happened that night. But I have vivid memories. My dad did. My uncle did. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And by the way, I've never spoken about those. I've never written about these incidents. And only once have I spoken about them publicly. And that was at Awakened Aware, briefly. Well, I wrote about all those experiences uh, for the first time uh, in my book. Oh, great. Um, by the way, I also wrote about my lab abduction phenomena. Right. And uh, you know one of the people that I wrote about? He's a friend of ours. An experience that he went through. And, uh, and it's all in the book UFO Nexus. All right. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, in 1983, I saw another UFO. This was a USO. This was an orb that came out of the ocean, Point Reyes, California. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. I can't forget these things. Every time I heard the same sound, it's like I was drawn to these things. Or they were drawn to me. I don't know. But I was there. I seen these things. Okay, but you say you saw entities and grays and all kinds of things while you were sort of paralyzed i mean you must have really gone into an altered state really to survive that time right 
It's oh, got to yeah. be the, an excruciatingly difficult were, thing to go were, through. There, oh, yeah. There were three instances where they had to bring me back. Right. And in, be, in between those near-death experiences, I had the ability to teleport myself into this other reality. Mm -hmm. And they, these creatures were actually visiting from that different reality through an individual that was working at that hospital, him and his son. And they were trying to kill me. They were torturing me. Oh, no. I'm not, I wasn't, I wasn't hallucinating. Right. The great, I saw, I, the, all of the nurses were able to walk around as if there was nothing going on apart from the emergency. But I could see this individual who was not entirely human speaking with these grays. And by the way, I believe that the, the technology that they used to traverse back and forth operated on what? what John A. Kill called the ultra-terrestrial phenomenon. These beings existed because of the state that I was in near death. I could see them. But nobody else in the hospital could see them. But the two, the father and the son nurse, so the father was, he was like in his late 40s. The son was in his early 20s. Could not, I can't stand these guys. They... From the moment I was there, they were trying to kill me. They kept torturing me. The other nurses kept bringing me back to life. Wow. And I saw the two of them conversing with these gray, non-human entities. I wrote about that in my book, The Cross, which will be, coming, will be coming out this year. Well, John Keel, he's the Mothman guy, right? Right, right. But uh, Mothman, but he's heavily known for ultra-terrestrials. Yeah. Because it's such an interesting concept. Sure. And I believe in it. I also believe in Mac Tony's crypto terrestrial. There's not one, there's not only one type of non human entity. I agree. Us. We're surrounded by them. Well, you know, we're I was abducted. I have an implant. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know that, right? So I, I didn't talk about it back in the day, but I, you know, I talk about it now. So I'm not, none of this surprises me. I've had all kinds of, you know, I don't know what you, you remember, want to call it. You remember when people were making a lot of fun of Dr. John Lear? Dr. Lear? Well, was with, it Roger Lear? yeah, what John was Lear. Okay. Oh, and he was essentially um, coming into contact with individuals that, in, that clearly had influence. The technology that was not human technology. I you mean Roger in... Roger Lear is the doctor. You yeah, Dr. Roger him. Lear. Sorry okay. Okay. I was confusing him with John Lear from Yeah, Los no, Angeles. John, you know John Lear died. I That's mean the, he's the yes, pilot. Yes. And Wonderful. I also remember your interviews, by yeah. the way. Uh John Lear, I want to show you something. Uh in my book, uh John plays a prominent role in my book. Uh, the, in the in the prologue that I wrote about underground facilities, I literally have John Lear and Phil Schneider. See, it's a full color. Right. But a whole bunch of, there's so much information. I have Lucifer from the Denver International Airport. I have the Dulcie facility. Right. And I have, this, is, this by the way, uh, this is the, uh, the Human Animal Hybrid Prohibition Act of 2009 from Congress. A lot of people don't know where to find that. Well, it's in my book. UFO Highway 2.0, it's all right. there. But uh, Roger Lear, yeah, clearly was working on people who assisting them, helping them by removing this implant, detecting them, then removing them. I met a family in Dulce, New Mexico. A mother, a father, and their daughter. This is back in the 1960s that this happened. They went out for a picnic. They saw a bright light in the middle of the sky above them, just a super bright light. It knocked them all out. They woke up hours later in the evening, and all three of them had scars on their arm. And they didn't know what it was. It was like the size of a rice grain. Something was in there. Yes. But the, the scars had completely healed. You can still see the scar, but 
it was the it was this technology that was used to place these implants in them was uh, far beyond anything that humans were capable of at that, at that time. And it wasn't until the 80s that they realized that it was technology that was in the arms. They didn't know what had happened. But in 2016, I interviewed this family. And I was able, with a metal detector, to detect that there's something in their arms. Mm-hmm. So, Dulce, New Mexico is a very strange place. Beautiful, gorgeous but heavily enigmatic in what it represents. Well, you actually, you almost died there, though. Right. I, when the first, the second time I went to Dulce, uh, Rick Prestel and I went, and um, we were supposed to meet with uh, Jesse Ventura uh, and uh, Terrell Ventura and Sean Stone. Uh, I was supposed to have been on that Reptilians episode that they were having in Dulce. And um, I I couldn't get there until the day after they left. Well, they were not allowed to go up to the Archuleta Mesa or onto Mount Archuleta, certain areas of Mount Archuleta that they wanted right. to go to. They were, they were forced to go east to Lumberton. So everything you saw on the show was actually from Lumberton, <laughs> not Dulce. Okay. Well, we're, when Rick and I got there, that that we were two o'clock in the morning on Monday on that that Monday, um, because we drove for the weekend to get there. We ended up meeting with Nancy Collado, Waylon Collado, and these are two former police officers, tribal tribal uh, police officers. Her great uncle was a uh, president of the tribal council, and I believe her grandfather was also at one time the president. We met with Ty Vicente, who was the vice president. He welcomed us in. We spoke with him. He knew exactly who I was because I was friends with the Colano family, a very well to, well-known family in Dulce. They drove all the way to California to meet me back in 2010, 2011, when I first came out with the book. And then, lo and behold, I had met Nancy Colado since 2011, because in 2010, I had met her in Dulce. I didn't realize that it was her. Mm. Uh, she and I were having breakfast, and uh, Dave Valdez was there. We were uh, we were at the uh, Wild Horse in the little restaurant. Anyway, years later, when I went back with Rick, they allowed us to go up to the Archuleta Mesa, up to the top. When we got there, we discovered these uh, massive containers for jet engines from the U.S. Air Force. Heavy, hundreds of pounds made out of steel, and they were up there at the top of the Archuleta Mesa. We're like, what are these doing here? And that's when Waylon Collado, former police officer, started to freak out. And he says, turn your cameras off. We didn't turn the cameras off. Stop taking pictures. We didn't stop taking pictures. He says, I don't want my truck. I don't want me or my dog on any of this film that you're doing. And I started taking pictures of Rick anyway. And Rick started moving them, and I started moving one of them. And lo and behold, when I moved the one, a gust of air came from underneath, from beneath the shipping container. I could barely move this thing. It was massive. I took photos of it. And I shared the photos of everybody at the ASPE conference in uh, Angel Fire, New Mexico. Uh, this was Janet Saylor's uh, Alliance for a study, the, a study of Paranormal Experiences. She's a beautiful woman. And a uh, good friend of mine. I flew her out in 2012. Masaki Alphonse, where you were. I flew uh, Janet Taylor out. Anyhow, she's she's a she's a senior citizen. She's an older person, but she's just a beautiful person. But that night, we were going to stay over at the Colados' house. They invited us to stay at their home. We were also going to have dinner in a in a little town called Chama, which was 30 miles away. Mm. Something was wrong yeah. as we were driving. To Chama, I started to get dizzy and nauseous. By the time we got to the restaurant, I should have been enjoying this prime rib, this baked potato, and this, this steamed veggies and a massive beer. And I was just, it was it was the evening for us to have fun. Right. I could barely stay away. I kept I kept experiencing these fainting moments of fainting. And then the pain started. 
and my entire head was on fire. I literally felt like my brain had mm -hmm. turned into some sort of like liquid and was on fire. It was that bad. So we got back. We had to leave. Everybody was disappointed. I'm so sorry. I owe everybody a steak dinner. We had to leave. We got back to Dulce. Nicolato wanted me to stay. But I said to Rick, I said, Rick, I have to get to that hotel and see if I can get a room. I have to be on my own. So we got back to the hotel. Rick helped me. We got a room. I went up. And um, I literally went to the ice machine and kept filling up the bathtub with ice. And then I put water in there and I immersed myself for the entire evening in an ice bath because I was hot to the touch. And I, I don't know what was wrong. The next day, I woke up. I encountered this woman, I believe a crypto terrestrial or potentially a hybrid at the restaurant. Gorgeous, super tall woman, olive skin, larger than normal eyes, almond shaped eyes. Um, she started talking to me, asking me questions. Why was I there? Where was I the previous day? What am I going to be doing that in the evening? Where am I going the next? I was like, what's with all these questions? I just wanted to have breakfast and get past the pain that I was experiencing. Lo and behold, I get back to the Colado's house after that breakfast, and I told them about this woman. And they literally said to me, who are you talking about? I said, the woman, the tall woman, the, the very attractive woman at the, at the uh, Wild Horse. The waitress, and they said, there is no tall woman that works at the at the uh, casino <laughs> restaurant at the Wild Horse. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> I described her. I described her to them exactly. I even told them all the questions that she had asked me. And Nancy had this strange look on her face. And she says, my niece, who's barely 18, and my great aunt are the only two that work there. Neither, neither of whom you're describing. So obviously that was a plant. Whoever that woman was, because by the way, those other two women that supposedly worked there, the niece and the great aunt, I, where were they? They were not there. I only saw this one person. Yeah, that fascinating. Night, that night when we got to uh, Angel Fire, New Mexico. No, no, no. Uh, actually, that night we went to Taos, New Mexico. I was going outside with Rick. We were going to have some brandy and a cigar and talk, whatever, shop. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't feel my left shoulder from right here. I couldn't feel it. I was like, what is going on? It's numb. Then I couldn't feel my neck. Then I couldn't feel the left side of my face. And just out of curiosity, I started touching the top of my head. Nothing. I was completely numb that evening. From here all the way up to the top. But I could still move. I still had movement. To this day, I can't even smile like a normal person. This side is still affected. But the following day, everything was dead on the left side. Zero sensitivity on my shoulder, my chest, my neck, face. Do you remember everything. that uh, Miriam yep. and we I met. tried to help you? Yeah. We met. Uh, Rick Purcell and I drove to uh, San Francisco. We met with you at a secret location. Oh, yeah, I forgot. That was right during that time. That's <clears> incredible. And there was a certain individual whose name I still remember and what country he hailed from who told you exactly what I was uh, afflicted with. Yeah, and it actually coincided with what the doctors at Sutter Medical had said to me because they, mm -hmm. they said to me, this is not Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy essentially affects the face. It doesn't affect your chest, your yeah, shoulder. No, no, you had so, to have a toxin. You had a, a toxin. toxin. A yeah, toxin. nerve agent. And, and, and Waylon Collado, who the former police officer, explicitly told us, "Don't touch these things that are up here. They they could be laced with stuff we are not aware of. Right. They don't want you moving these containers." And exposing what's beneath. I mean, you're actually, I don't know, you must be like a cat with nine lives because you, sh 
arguably you might not have survived that at all. I mean, we, you know, that, that was so insane. There's something else about that story you don't know that I've never shared. Okay. Um, Rick Bristol knows about this. Um, Brandon Collado, the son of Nancy and Waylon. No, Brandon left hand. He's Nancy Collado's son. Brandon left hand's father is the chief of police of Tauth Pueblo. They know about this because they were there that day. I went to a clinic. The clinic said, you, you got to go to a hospital. You can't. There's nothing we can do for you here. So we went to the hospital uh, there in uh, Taos. And uh, we had left Taos, but well, we went into Taos and we went to the hospital. They did an x-ray on me. And they said to me, what is, have you ever had surgery on the right side of your head? <laughs> surgery? I'm like, when I was 24, I had a cholesteatoma, which is a golf ball size mass of tissue. It's benign. And it just grew on this side, on my left side. And there's a scar behind my ear. And the doctor took it out and sewed me back up. Fine. And I said to him, yeah, on this side. And he goes, no, 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 no. And he showed me the x-ray. He goes, wow. that. He goes, that on this side of your head. There was a small, no larger than a dime, but in the shape of a donut, like a toroid, in my inner ear. Bright white, brilliant, like glowing. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. He goes, I don't know. To this day, that thing is still in my head. I don't know what it is. Oh. But they saw it. So, yeah. That's well, it might have been responsible for keeping you alive. Because why did you get sick in the first place? The the per paralysis for those they, two years. Well, so where did that come from? Yeah. So the you know, this is another thing. <laughs> yeah, you have a really strange <clears throat> background. So, right. So in 2019, the Guillaume Barre. Well, I can't claim this to something mysterious. I don't know, but. Uh, Someone, I have I, you infection. have been saved a number of times, so I have to say, because I know things that I'm not at liberty to, dis to disclose mm -hmm. much here. Um, but I, I just have to say that, you know, you have you may have had attacks on the one hand, but you got protection on the other. So I the remember talking have with, lived. Has I remember survived. talking with Miriam Delicato, who told me that, yes, I have been under attack for a, by a lot of people from a lot of organizations. Anyway. But in 2019, I got a sinus infection. And my immune system, instead of attacking the sinus infection, it attacked my nervous system and it destroyed it. The vagus nerve completely destroyed it. There's a thin layer of fat that covers all of, all of our nerves. Mm. All around our nerves, there's a thin layer of fat. Well, that was decimated. Every nerve was exposed. And again, I was completely paralyzed for two years. And then the first... Three months, I died three times, and they had to bring me back. I have this permanent scar in my neck right here. It's permanent. I had a tube in there, and I had a feeding tube in my stomach right here for six months. The feeding tube and the breathing tube. By the way, in November of 2019, all I could do was ask the nurse to prop up my phone with my right finger, I could scan the, the phone. I couldn't even lift it. I had to put pillows underneath my arm, and then I could just scan the phone. And, you know, so I started watching YouTube videos. I'm not a typical YouTube viewer. <laughs> I watch YouTube videos that are being posted by people in Iran, South Africa, Brazil, China. So at the beginning of 2019, of November of 2019, I started seeing videos that were that were not being shown to a U.S. audience or a Western audience. I started seeing Chinese that were in hysterics. I started seeing videos of dead people piled up in hallways in Chinese hospitals. And I immediately recognized something is happening in China. Mm. Something is coming. And it's really bad. And the videos that I were watching 
started getting taken down by the Chinese government. They went to YouTube and said, take that video down. Take it. Well, I saw them and I could screen capture the what I was seeing. From my phone, using my finger, I logged into Amazon and I started buying and boxes of N95 masks, goggles. I have all of them still. Um, and these, um, I don't have them here, but uh, hundreds of the hand sanitizers, the Purell, the little mini ones, hundreds of them. And my son thought I was crazy. My buddy Rick Ristel thought I was crazy. I have a closet filled with boxes of pasta, boxes of spaghetti sauce, boxes of cup of soups, a cup of noodles. My room was, everything, they were like, Dad, stop. Stop what you're doing. And I told, and I, I couldn't talk to them. I couldn't even scribble on paper. Uh. All I could do was type on my phone. And I was having difficulties. Then, <laughs> then in, the, in December, the next month in December, uh. The middle of December, I finally got my release from the hospital. Six months. Six months. And I fought with the doctors to leave. And um, the fire department had to bring me up the stairs on a, on a little gurney. I couldn't move. But my house was filled with boxes of N the, <laughs> the most sophisticated N95 masks that you could get. Goggles, pure everything. I bought Lysol, I bought hand wipes, I bought it all. And sure enough, January, February, what did we learn? COVID-19. Yeah, except the mask doesn't do jack shit, but that's well, fine. But I bought it anyway, and then the, these $35 boxes of masks that I bought were already selling for $400 on eBay. Uh, yeah, right. I was I was giving them away. I, I was not going to be one of these bastards that was you know stealing from the public. All the masks, all the goggles, all the pure. I was giving it away to friends and family for free. And they I thought it was insane. They're like, man, you can make a killing on eBay. <laughs> and I was with my little finger typing back to him, shut the hell up. That's not who I am. And I give it away. Yeah. Well, okay. So so two years you were like that. Then you got better for a year. And then, because mm. I'm trying to figure out, now you've been better for what? Uh, uh, like six months or sort of? Um, I started I started working again in uh, March 2022. So I've been working in March of 2022. I could do two minutes of talking, and then I would have to rest for 30 to 40 minutes. Right. Two minutes first. Okay. But an angel hired me to work at their software company. Oh. Brilliant individual, just one of the people that I'm most grateful to because he knew that I was getting better. He had gone through something similar years ago. Wow. Yeah, and. Um, Today, I'm one of the top API engineers at this company in Southern California. I work in Sacramento here on my computers remotely right. for two years. Beautiful company. That's wonderful. And, and um, Gary, uh, GBS, Guillaume Barre syndrome, affects one out of every 100,000 people. And there's no uh, genetic connection. You, you, it's not something you inherit from your bloodline. You're, it's just pure randomness. And so I got it. And by the way, I'm driving again. I'm able to speak again. Not perfectly, but I'm trying. But I'm writing I'm my good to me. I am writing interviews, uh, excuse me, articles. I'm writing books. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to continue. No, you're a man on a, with a mission. Uh, but I'm very curious. I mean, I don't even know if you know what your mission is. Um. I think for me, from my childhood, the inter the the interaction that I have had with uh, both UFOs and non-human entities, greys essentially, I've seen greys, and this most recent event in my life, this near-death experience, this series of near-death experiences, where I, again I saw greys, greys that are meeting the definition of. The Department of Defense that says they're demonic entities, that they have been here all along. Some of them are of extraterrestrial origin. Other non-human entities are of terrestrial origin, crypto-terrestrials, ultra-terrestrials. Well, and a lot of the grays are are reptilian hybrids. <clears throat> okay, 
and they are, um, I don't know if you know who Cyrus Parse is. Did you ever see my interviews with Cyrus Parse? I recognize the name. He's a very interesting guy. Now he's gone, he's gone to ground, as we say. So he's disappeared off the, basically off the whole scene. And hopefully he's still alive. I wasn't briefly in touch with him. Um, I met him in person. Uh, he came on my show. We had some a few big arguments because he he went to a certain point and he wouldn't go beyond it. But apparently, whatever he did say, he then got tortured by some ETs, mm -hmm. basically. Well, I'm probably going to get tortured. You know why? Why? Because I don't give a crap. I talk about these things in my books. I, talk about I, I do too, but I don't get tortured necessarily. Oh, I mean, I have here's had the... some incidents of things. I was here's... hit with a scalar weapon and stuff. So oh. once in a while I get, you know, they mess with me, but right now they, my website has been down for like three weeks. Oh my God. Oh my God. Ever since I did an interview with, believe it or not, Jay Widener really? about the Kennedy assassination. And then they attacked my website. They broke the whole thing. We had to go to a new server. Now they're, my webmaster, he's not working full time, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I wish you would, but yeah. he's got another job. So he, he yeah. only fits me in, but I'm trying to hire somebody. But the bottom line is that they've been keeping me under attack for the last yeah. three weeks it's insane. There's there's a lot going on out there, as you can appreciate, right? Mm, Th mm. That we, it does seem like we're on the verge of something, right? Well, we're already seeing reptilians. Do you remember back in 2013 at the APAC conference? Mm -hmm. What was the official response when we saw this entity show up on the screen? Uh -huh. Nothing. There was no official comment or response from the U.S. Secret Service or the White House regarding the conspiracy theory. Incredible. <laughs> The absence of response leaves room for lots of interpretation. In fact, no official comment is effectively a non-denial. In my book, I do an entire section on everybody's favorite topic, the reptilians. And this right. time, I really talk about the reptilians. Well, you know, while you've been, I don't know where you were during this time, but I've done a lot of interviews with Captain Mark Richards all about reptilians. In fact, there I just posted something. What are you mm -hmm. showing me, though? An email from somebody who you intimately know that told me that in 2006, <laughs> Anthony, in 2006, I engaged in a series of correspondence with a senior scientist whose name I possess but will not disclose. According to him, several years ago, he received an assignment related to the maintenance or installation of specific equipment at the Dulcie facility. And uh, during his visit, he did in fact encounter a reptilian entity engaged in silent communication with a gray entity at Dulcie. So I talk about the reptilians yeah. in my book a lot. And you know that person, and I'll tell you offline who it was. I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, well, mm. I know we've been going for a while and I know your vo voice isn't super strong. So I, I want to be, yeah. you know, attentive to that. So right. I'm, I know people are going to be very excited to hear this interview because uh, you're so, you know, full of energy and you've gone through so much and well, I, you. you know, I'm sure they're going to be interested in getting your books. Are your books available on Amazon? Yep. Uh, my books are available at ufocurrents.com in the books tab. On, on your website. Okay. But they are, as a matter of fact, I have a gentleman right now turning all three of my books, which should be done in a week, into ebooks. In the, oh, in great. The e so they're going to be at Amazon and they're going to be at Apple. Oh, good. Because I like ebooks personally, because mm -hmm. I travel a lot. They're just easier to deal with. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, where are you headed? What's your plans now? You know, what are, are, um, cause you used to do a show, didn't you? Back in the day, I, as I remember. I did. I did. And I have another show uh, right now at UFO Currents. Uh, it, oh, well, really? You can go to, yeah, you can go to strangeradiocentral.com. Or if you go to UFO Currents and click on podcasts, it'll take you there. Okay. Strange Strangeradiocentral.com is my podcast. And since I've only started talking again, 
around November, December, where I can speak in, you know, like minutes at a time, whereas before I couldn't speak at all. Right. Um, I started doing podcasts again. And um, somebody said to me, though, Anthony, it sounds like you're talking to Congress. Start being yourself. Start being regular. Old <laughs> Anthony. Don't stop this trying to impress the MUFON crowd, which are a bunch of my friends, by the way. So I'm going to do that. Oh, okay. The um the the if you go to ufocurrents.com and click on podcast, you can hear the ones that I've done. They're All good. Right. But I'm gonna start doing the interview. By the way, I'm doing I got invited to speak at MUFON at the International Symposium in July. So that's the first time I'm ever going to uh, appear at the international annual symposium. And uh, Brad Olson is going to be there. Good friend of yours, Brad yeah. Olson. I love Brad. Yeah. So I'll meet up with Brad, and I want to say that Brad and I are probably the two most the the two people that will be there who operate on the fringe, uh, the fringes of the ufological spectrum, and that's okay because for the first time in history, the information that is coming about, coming out from military professionals presented to the government. Congress, no less, and now being blasted all over the mainstream media is doing what? It's providing validation to all those individuals like you, Bill Ryan, myself, Brad Olson, who were talking about all this stuff back in the 90s and the 2000s. Yeah. It's validation. Yeah. It's going to start taking this. Oh, now all of a sudden, the Department of Defense is saying that these entities are perhaps demonic and they will unravel the religious uh, the religious spectrum across the globe. Well, of course it will. John Keel told us about the ultra-terrestrials. Mac Tony's before he died, God bless him, wrote about the crypto-terrestrials. Those two intersect and provide information that prove that people like me are not crazy. Sure, but... Um... What about, you know, you wrote, you had a character in UFO Highway called the Colonel, right? Colonel, right. And so UFO Highway 2.0, I point out how Bill Ryan and I spoke way back in the way back in the day. My colonel said that I was going to be contacted by CRW. Offline, I'll tell you who CRW is. CRW was actually heard by Bill Ryan. Bill Ryan, Mel Fabregas, Jerry Pippen, the late Jerry Pippen, and Norio Hayakawa were all on the phone with me. We called the aerospace firm down near the Long Beach area, down in that area. Okay, so that's t oh, like TRW. Please. That's so you're saying CRW is related to TRW. Well, no, no, no. CRW is a person. Oh. Yeah, that's a person. Those are his initials. I that's checked it. out his FAA license, everything. It's all in UFO Highway 2. All right. We got on the phone. Bill Ryan sent somebody out there with a camera to take photos of the building that he worked in. It definitely was an aerospace firm. We called the phone number on the day he said, and at the time he said, took off, and oh my God, the guy worked there at a vault. Mr. X worked at a vault. We were told that CRW also worked at a vault, at an aerospace firm. Uh, aerospace firm. Okay. It's all in the book. You have it now. You can read exactly what I'm talking about. All right. CRW is a real person. The colonel told me that that person was going to contact me. The colonel told me that I was going to be in contact with these people called Project Camelot, who I didn't know about. <laughs> and all of it happened. Okay. You know, one thing I'll tell you, geez, I can't believe I'm about to tell you this. There was an older brother of the colonel, hmm. who was on a ship. They had an incident. This is what propelled the colonel to get involved in the Air Force after he graduated with his BS in psychology into these Type X events. Oh. The wife of the colonel couldn't stand me because she felt what I was doing by putting his information out there was endangering her um, her kids and him. But you kept him secret pretty much. Mm -hmm. You know what pisses me off, Carrie? Nobody expects Linda Moulton Howe, Richard Dolan, T 
to give up their, their whistleblowers. You better tell me the name of that person, who they are. Yet I'm held to a different standard. All these bastards back in the early days, the 2009s, the 2010s, were demanding that I tell them who the colonel was. Really? So I made a solemn vow, a promise to him that I would never divulge. Well, we have because of the, the, whistleblowers, we never exactly, dis disclose. Exactly. And that's, that's the one thing that I really, you know, I, I, this guy, I'm not going to mention his name because he doesn't deserve any credit. He just magically appeared at a MUFON conference in 2010. He had never attended that conference before. Right. It's a local Sacramento conference. I knew the lady that was throwing the conference. I was told to get in touch with her to talk about just the Colonel X. This guy just shows up out of nowhere, befriends me, then becomes my biggest detractor trying to undo everything. It's so funny because I, I filed the standard form 180 with the National Personnel Records Center. Okay. They gave me a DD 214. I owned a corporation called Matrix Innovative Systems. Okay. At the time. I held something called a California Multiple Award Schedule, which allowed me to work with the Army Corps of Engineers, the FBI, um, anybody, anybody within the state of California on that particular level. Crap, I did a two-year contract with the California Highway Patrol, who had just taken over the role of the state police. Right when that happened, this was after 9-11, the, the state police in California went away. The California Highway Patrol got involved. They were now protecting the governor handling all of the responsibilities. For two years, <clears throat> I worked with the FBI, John Hopkins University, and the California Highway Patrol. You know why? Because I was hired to develop, uh, to revamp the uh, Civis and Sea Vision, the California Vehicle Inspection System, and the and the uh, commercial vehicle uh, the commercial vehicle inspection uh, system network which was from the FBI and John Hopkins University, uh, the APL. Post 9-11, all of the counties, if you're ever on the freeway in California, uh, whenever you enter a county, there's a way station where the trucks have to pull over. Well, that's the software that they use to check the trucks for contraband, oh. especially after 9-11, because they were paranoid about people bringing bombs or whatever. Anyway, but um, so... Using the California Multiple Awards schedule, I was able to file a standard form 180 and get what? A DD-214. Here is the DD-214. That's the kernel DD-214. Okay. In it, there's one anachronism. There's, a, there's an anachronism. And essentially, there is a, um, there's a code that was entered that essentially forced me to act myself. Was the document tampered with? Could it have been a mere oversight or an inadvertent error? Yeah. You want to know why, Carrie? I had received so many DD 214s from active duty uh, active duty reservists who wanted to work for my company and retired uh, military personnel who okay. wanted to work for my company. Some were typed, some were handwritten. They were all different. None of them were the same. Whoever put, processed this DD 214. They redid all the kernel's information onto a new template. And then the one box, they just grabbed whatever was the release code at that time and put it in. It was 13 years after he retired. So they grabbed the one that was active at the time of the DD-214. All right. So, well, it's arguably fake then, right? The No, it's it's a, it's a legitimate DD-214. What it was, it was just a mistake. It was a typo that somebody made. They just grabbed the wrong piece of information when they were uh, filling out the DD-14. Yeah. Well, is he still alive then? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Great. Yeah. Well, um, this has been a lot of fun. It's so interesting to catch up with you, Anthony, and to see what you've been through. My God. Um, Thank you. I'm very glad you're still alive. I hope you'll stay with us, you know. Thank you. And 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 I think you you bring a you know, you're you were always a wonderful, you know, voice out there, contributor, you know, great energy, the whole thing. Perhaps, perhaps um I'll be doing another conference soon and you'll be there because <laughs> everybody here in Sacramento, I spoke at the MUFON uh the, the Rockland MUFON here, which is 
suburb of Sacramento. And everybody said, you need to do that SAC UFO con again. You need to bring back Terry Cassidy. You need oh, to bring my back God. <laughs> everybody. And I was like, well, I think maybe that's what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That'd be mm-hmm. fun. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, there's a lot of uh, water under the bridge, and um, I'm sure we're we're missing uh, some very interesting. We could double back and do this again if you're up for it uh, sometime in Absolutely. the near future, in a you know few weeks, and and see where you're at and everything. Sure. Because I do think there's going to be a lot of uh, attention paid, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you know Sean David Morton. Did you ever meet? I did. Yeah, I remember Sean. You know he's been under attack, and he, you know they right. they threw him in prison. They they beat him up. They did all this horrible stuff to him. He got cancer. He's you know he's in and out of consciousness constantly. He's he, yeah. you know he's in your situation. He couldn't speak. He can't speak. Oh my God! I did not know that. Yeah, and um, yeah. I you know. It's insane. He's got so much, you know, people sending him healing, sending him in this, that, every technique under the sun. Uh, it's just a mystery as to why he hasn't bounced back, but he hasn't. Um, he's still borderline right now. Hey, you so, can't him. What? You can, if you reach out to Sean, please let him know that I sent my... All right. You know, I will. Um, the thing that I was talking about was the Air Force Policy Directive on the DD-214. And I put that to rest. This book shows that this person was is legitimate. Okay. Everything they told us was the truth. All the families in Dulcie corroborate what this man said. The ones that worked there in 1979. So, I mean, it's, it's coming out, Carrie. It's coming out. Yeah. We're not I alone. Know. We're not alone on this planet in our government and our military. I know, but it's We're it's really an uh, it's an uphill struggle. There's a lot of uh misdirects, you know. There's a lot of uh they're trying to rewrite history. I'm so glad you're back with us because can we totally trust can we totally trust like you, you can know, we totally have trust memory? Can we really trust David Grush? Not 100%. Is he a whistleblower? Hell no, he's not a whistleblower. No. He's former counterintelligence. What did they right. excel in? Obfuscating, yeah. telling us different stories. Well, okay. You can't and even give us his information without permission from the Pentagon first. Okay. You know, one of the guys that had like the best story, um, and I wish I had his name right in front of me, but I, I saw it earlier today, but I can't mm-hmm. I just have a black. His first name's Michael. You mm-hmm. know what you want to mean? He's one of the, Michael. yeah, he's one of the whistleblowers. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I had a long conversation with him. He was going to come on my show and then nothing. He said he didn't and said, no, he couldn't. And so on. So, so, but he has one of the most interesting stories of the group that Grush was dealing with. Right. People are reaching out to me. (laughs) Whistleblowers are reaching out to me for the first time in a long time because I'm healthy again. And I'm able to respond. A lot of people didn't understand why I wasn't responding. Well, I was paralyzed for two years and I couldn't speak for two years. Yeah, I didn't know so that. Now, now that I'm getting this interaction, um, I'm having to go to these uh, because not everything that's being sent to me is is, is truthful. I can right. immediately tell when I'm being hoaxed. Yeah. But some of them, some of them are very compelling, just like Colonel X. And I, I'm like, okay, let's see what you got. Let right. me do the research. Let me look into it. And if it's legitimate, and if you want the story out there, I'll put it out there for you. I just talked with uh, Dr. Michael Sala yeah. on his show. I was having a bad day with my voice, but it went okay. okay. It wasn't as good as this. It was not as good as this. I could not conversate like this. I was incapable of articulating to this level. Uh-huh. But that was my first interview back. Period. All right. Good for you. But, uh, Gary, I love you. Thank you so much. It's you well, I love amazing. you too. And it's just wonderful to see you back and see you looking good and everything. Thank you. So, so um, so hang in there. You know, we've got we got a big history, you and I back going oh, back, yeah. right? Because you were always yeah. around, you, you know, we were in the same circles all the time. Mm-hmm. So uh it's it's really nice to see you and and, and everything. So and I uh, need to remind you, 
I've sent you a friend request on Facebook. You got a friend, you got to accept it. Oh, you okay. probably got a thousand sitting there. I do, one. believe me. It's insane. I'm one of them. One of them. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll look for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. No worries. Uh, all right. Take care. And thank you for coming on the show. Take Bye, care of everybody. yourself. Thank you. And, and, guys, and stay in touch, you, you so know, much. text me and Absolutely. stay in touch. We'll, you know, I'll, I'll reconnect you with people. You know what I'm saying? Every week, every month. You got it. Thank you. Karen. Okay, good. Bye, everybody.